Welcome back to the series of videos where I am breaking down every single Harry Potter film. We're taking an in-depth look at every single little detail so you guys can see the films like you've never seen them before. I'm going to dive deep into Harry Potter lore and give you all the Harry Potter knowledge that I have. These could be ideas from the books, things that were released after the books finished, behind the scenes facts, and just some details that I thought were noteworthy. I'll link the first three parts of the series down below, and they should also be in a playlist with all the videos together. If you enjoy this video, please hit that like button to help with the algorithm. Doing that will greatly help the channel, meaning I can make more fun videos like this one. Now that I've said that, let's get the video started. In the reflection of the Warner Brothers logo, you can see Nagini's scales as she slithers along. Looking further into Harry Potter lore, Nagini has an interesting backstory that we learn about in the Fantastic Beasts films. She was originally a human who got a blood curse, which branded her as a maledictus. This means that she can transform from human to animal at will, but eventually over time, she will be permanently stuck in that animal form, which for her is of course a snake. Also, at this point in time, Nagini had just become a horcrux for Voldemort, as he killed a ministry employee named Bertha Jorkins and used her death to put a piece of his soul inside of Nagini. The graveyard they're in is part of the former Riddle household in the town Little Hangleton. This is where Voldemort killed his muggle father when he was still a student at Hogwarts, and all of them were buried here. If you look at this headstone and brighten it quite a bit, the gravestone is for a woman named Rebecca, and translating this piece, which is Hebrew, her last name is Rivqua, which I probably butchered the pronunciation of, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> This graveyard, created by the brilliant set designer Stuart Craig, was inspired by the real-life cemetery Highgate in London, which Craig said inspired the Reclaimed by Nature look. As the shot pans up, we see the tombstone of Thomas Riddle, Voldemort's grandfather, who lived from 1880 to 1943, Mary Riddle, Voldemort's grandmother, who lived from 1883 to 1913, and their son Tom Riddle, aka Voldemort's father, who lived from 1905 to 1943, the statue connected to the gravestone is the Angel of Death, and we will see this in the film later on. This is the second film to have silver text for the title, meaning we had two gold in a row and now have two silver in a row. This pattern would end with the fifth and sixth films, however. The man we see in the caretaker's house of the manor is Frank Bryce, who was actually accused and arrested for the murders of the Riddle family after Voldemort killed them. However, when they realized nothing had been done to their bodies, which was of course explained by the killing curse that muggles of course couldn't explain, the muggle police had no choice but to release Frank. He stayed on as the caretaker for a few owners after the Riddles, but everyone in the town believed him guilty. As I recall, you won't score. Voldemort saying that Wormtail called the nearest gutter pipe his home is a reference to how he escaped in his rat form in the last installment. This is of course Barty Crouch Jr., who interestingly was not in this scene for the movie. We also hear Nagini speaking in parcel tongue to Voldemort, the language of snakes. <laughs> Voldemort has this power because he is a descendant of Salazar Slytherin. Voldemort uses the Avada Kedavra curse. Which is the Killing Curse, one of the three unforgivable or illegal curses, and as you can see, the Killing Curse produces a green light. This is the first time we've seen or heard this spell in the series. Though we did almost hear it in an improvised line by Jason Isaacs in the second film. <laughs> Looking at Ron's room, you can see a comic book here, which is most likely The Adventures of Martin Miggs the Mad Muggle, a comic that was mentioned in the second book and that had a heavy presence in small details in the last movie. You can also see a ton of Chudley Cannon merchandise, which is Ron's favorite Quidditch team. It's on this flag on the wall, on his bed sheets, on the lamp, and on all of these stickers as well. And in this shot, you can see even more of these stickers behind his bed, as well as a whistle, which he might have used when playing Quidditch in the backyard with his brothers. This is all great attention to detail, because it's exactly how his room was described in the book, covered in orange Chudley Cannon's memorabilia. This strapping young lad must be Cedric, am I right? Cedric had actually been introduced before this in the books, as he was the seeker during the Hufflepuff match in the last movie, which I pointed out in my last video for this series. That isn't just any man kill boot, mate. It's a port key. The word port key comes from the French word porter, meaning to carry, and the word key is used to mean a secret or a trick. At the Quidditch World Cup, there is so much to point out. The location that Stuart Craig chose for the Quidditch World Cup was Beachy Head, which is 530 feet above sea level, making the Chalk Sea Cliff in Britain the perfect site for the vast stadium that had to be invisible to muggles. You can see tons of red and black flags, which is the color of the Bulgarian Quidditch team, as well as a few Irish flags who Bulgaria is playing. 
You can see all sorts of people flying around in the air. You can see the massive stadium on the horizon, which took the ministry an entire year to construct, even with magic. There are also people on stilts. In this shot, you can see an England flag, an Italian flag, a finishing flag for some reason, and people from both sides with painted faces, which gives this scene such a great atmosphere. In this shot, you can see two llamas walking by with house elves on their back, one of which could possibly be Winky the house elf, Body Crouch's servant who played a huge role in this book, but never appeared in the movie or maybe she did. You can see chimneys coming out of these tents, which was another detail mentioned in the books. If you notice here, there's a child, which could possibly be the child mentioned in the book who stole his father's wand and started doing magic on a slug with it. In this shot, you can see brooms hovering in the air, most likely waiting for their owners to mount it again while they're in their tent. You can also see people flying above the crowd chasing a ball. Here you can see someone handing out programs, and another person flying who wasn't as good as the last few as he almost hits everybody. We see folks reading the Daily Prophet right here, the most popular newspaper in the Wizarding World that we've seen many times. We also get a better look at the program the man was handing out earlier, which has great detail when brought up as it says the 422nd World Cup. Looking deeper, these programs show how much detail the filmmakers put into every aspect of the films they're making. The first page of the program mentions how the name Quidditch comes from Quidditch Marsh, which was the origin of Quidditch as we found out in Quidditch Through the Ages. This page also has an ad for Omnioculars, which Harry bought for everybody in the book. It allows you to zoom in, slow the game down, watch replays, and just see better. The next page of the program breaks down the different teams, and even has a layout with each member of each team, all of which was taken right from the novel. It also has ads for Pumpkin Juice, as well as the other sponsors, Butterbeer, Gringotts, and Nimbus 2001, which were the brooms that Draco's father bought the Slytherin team in the Chamber of Secrets. Those are Nimbus 2001s. How did you get those? A gift from Draco's father. As they walk into the tent, one of the twins is holding something in his hand, which is actually the omnioculars I just mentioned. As they walk in, you can see a woman washing her pants hands-free using magic. There's also a box with the number 17,343, which is their neighbor's campsite number, as we later see a view of their campsite number, which is 17,342, and these spots were given to them by the muggle running the campsite, Mr. Roberts. The tent they use here is actually the same tent that the trio used while on the run in the Deathly Hallows. This shot of the stadium really shows how Stort Craig was able to hide the stadium from the Muggles, as it's basically built inside of Beachy Head. Also, I always love the detail of how the tunnels to get into the stadium are built into the side of the mountain. Another brilliant idea from Stort Craig. As we see people from all different countries, there's a sign that says Ministry, and it points to where the minister's box is. This adds up as all of these important people, as well as the Malfoys back here, watch the match in the minister's box. The Weasleys and company actually sat there in the book, but they changed that for the films. Malfoy has a Slytherin pin on his jacket as well as a Slytherin ring, which we saw for the first time in the last movie and which I pointed out in my last video. The cane that Lucius uses to grab Harry actually houses his wand. If you remember, the snake is at the tip of both his wand and his cane. Looking at the shot of the stadium, we know from the book that 100,000 spectators sat in these stands. The fan next to the gang has a program like the one I talked about earlier. You can also see Ron using the omnioculars that I also explained earlier, possibly zooming in to see all around the stadium. It's interesting to see who everyone is rooting for, as Ron and Harry are donning Bulgaria merch, Ron also having a K on his cheek for Crumb, while the twins as well as Ginny and Hermione are rooting for Ireland. You can see the scoreboard in the shot, and it says the 422nd Quidditch World Cup, and I have to say, this is a big step up from the tiny little scoreboard they had at Hogwarts. The leprechaun they make out of fireworks references the fact that there are real leprechauns in the Wizarding World, and they were actually the mascot for their team in the novel. Looking at the Ireland team, we have Aiden Lynch in the middle, Troy to the right of him, Millet next to him, Quigley all the way to the right, and on the other side, we have Moran, Connolly, and Ryan. As Ireland comes out, a flag drops over the scoreboard that says top of the morning, which is just a great detail. And looking at the Bulgarian team, we have Crum in the front, Dimitrov to the left of him, Volchanov next to him, and Ivanova all the way to the left. Then on the other side, we have Levski to the right of Crum, Volkov next to him, and Zograf all the way to the right. Looking at Volchanov, he's an ancestor of a witch named Nerdia Volchanova, the A being added to the last name for females in the family. And she was the founder of Durmstrang Institute. And she not only founded the school, but she also served as the first headmistress. You can see the reflection of the stadium and Bulgarian flags in Ron's omnioculars, which is amazing attention to detail. The screen of Crumb actually covers a ton of seats, so I guess that means this screen is see-through on the spectator's side, which is pretty cool. Crumb's glasses are the same kind that Harry wore in the third film during the rainy game. 
And another thing that Crumb and Harry have in common is that Crumb is the number seven, which is a constant throughout the Harry Potter series, the number seven always appearing, which I've covered a bit throughout this series of videos, how the number seven is the most important number in the Harry Potter series. And I actually made a whole video on it, which I will link down below if you're interested. Crumb wearing gloves is sort of a mistake on the filmmaker's part, especially because he's the seeker. This is because stenches have flesh memories, which if you remember, drove a lot of the plot in the Deathly Hallows. They have this flesh memory so that if it's a close call between the two seekers, the snitch will remember whose flesh it touched first, thus deciding the winner. However, Crumb wearing gloves makes this impossible because it covers the flesh that would trigger the flesh memory. In the minister's box, you can see Barty Crouch, who was of course the father of Barty Crouch Jr., who we saw in the opening scene. You can also see Draco and his father Lucius here, who as I mentioned earlier got an invite from the minister himself. In the distance, you can see the two teams lining up just as they were on the program. The film of course skipped the whole match, but the result was that Crumb caught the snitch but Ireland still won as they were up by more than 150 points when Crumb caught it. The masks of the Death Eaters were heavily inspired by the KKK, which is quite clear with the point on their hats and masks. In the burned down campsite, you can see a compass on top of this tent, which we saw earlier in the film before the tent was burned down. More murder. <laughs> This spell and this mark in the sky were used back when Voldemort was around, and they would put it over their victims' homes after an attack. During that time, many witches and wizards would come home, see the dark mark above their house, and would know that their family inside were all dead, courtesy of the Death Eaters. All of these witches and wizards that came in the way they did, apparated, and the spell they used was the Stunning Spell, and just like in the book, the spell shoots out the color red. Among these wizards, we have the witch who sat next to the Malfoys in the stands of the match, as well as the man that sat next to Crouch, and also the chubby man that sat at the end over here. The Daily Prophet about the Dark Mark says, Terror at the Quidditch World Cup, which we know from the book was written by Rita Skeeter. At the top, there's an ad for Elop's Owl Emporium, an animal shop in Diagon Alley where Hedwig actually came from. You can see Hermione's cat Crookshank sitting in between her and Ron, and as I mentioned in my last video in the series, Crookshanks is half Neasel, a magical beast that is similar to a cat, but that's much smarter. Ron is also wearing one of Mrs. Weasley's hand-knitted sweaters that she gives him every single Christmas, evidenced by the fact that it has the letter R on it. As for the book that Ron is reading, for this shot, you can see it says, Flying, which means this is Flying with the Cannons, a book about Ron's favorite Quidditch team, the Chudley Cannons. Ron actually gifted this book to Harry in their second year, and he read it throughout their fourth year, which of course takes place during this movie. On the trolley, you can see all sorts of candy, like Acid Pops, Birdie Bots Every Flavor Beans, Pumpkin Juice, Sugar Butterfly Wings, Licorice Wands, Candy Snakes, Fizzing Wisbees, and you can see from this sign, it's all taken from Honey Dukes, the candy shop in Hogsmeade. Me, the town next to Hogwarts. The thing that Ron buys packet of Drubles. is Drubles' best blowing gum. And though we can't see it here, we know that pumpkin pasties are on this card as well because that's what Cho Chang buys. To the pumpkin pasties, please. Where Harry releases Hedwig is the same spot where Harry asked Lupin to teach him the Patronus charm in the last movie. The creatures pulling the Bobaton carriage are a Braxin, a breed of extremely large and powerful winged horses. Also, yes, that is how you pronounce the school. It is pronounced Bobaton, not Bobaton, like the movie said. The movies actually said it wrong. Of the Bobaton's Academy of Magic. Right here you can see Neville, and next to him just so happens to be Hannah Abbott, who Rowling later confirmed Neville would go on to marry. They of course did not know that when making this film because she released that after the seventh book was finished, so it's just a nice coincidence. Also in the crowd is Nigel, and this is his first ever appearance. He was a character made just for the films, and he sort of replaced Colin and Dennis Creevy. And we have another couple pairing, as Angelina Johnson pokes her head between Fred and George. Angelina and Fred of course went to the Yule Ball together, and they sort of dated after that. Then after Fred's death, George ended up marrying Angelina, and together they had two kids, one of which was named Fred Weasley Jr. in honor of his fallen uncle. The Durmstrang ship has the school's logo on the sail, which depicts a double-headed eagle. The spell the Bobaton girls used here was a transfiguration spell called the Butterfly Conjuring Spell. That's one big one. Madame Maxime is so big because she's a half-giant, which the films never specifically stated. And speaking of being half-human, half something else, Fleur Delacour's grandmother was a Vila, meaning Fleur is a quarter Vila. Vilas are beautiful, human-like beings who are irresistible to men, hence why all of the boys are standing, clapping, and whistling. Vilas were also the mascot for Bulgaria during the Quidditch World Cup in the book. The girl in the leotard dancing next to the Bobaton students is Fleur's little sister Gabrielle, who for some reason stays at the school for the entire year. She did not do that in the book. The costumes for the French school were made by French costume designer Jani Tamim. 
This is the first appearance of the Batil twins played by Shafali Chowdhury and Satira Shaw. They were in previous installments played by other actresses, but this is the first time they have speaking roles, and they would play the twins for the rest of the series. When the Durmstrang students come in and start smashing their canes, I always thought Filch's reaction was hilarious, like what the hell is happening? This Durmstrang student blows fire into either a phoenix or their school's logo but with only one head. The spell that automatically comes to mind is the one that creates fiend fire, which of course burned the Room of Requirement down in the final book, and which is very unstable. Considering this film was made before the introduction of fiend fire though, it might have just been a made up spell by the filmmakers who of course did not know what magical fire would become two years later during the final book. In this shot, you can see the Allery right here, which tells us this is on the opposite side of Hogwarts than we normally see where the first years come in on the boats in the Great Lake. The detail of Snape and Karkaroff sort of staring at each other is incredible, because both of them were former Death Eaters who betrayed Voldemort and helped the good side. The Durmstrang student sitting at the Slytherin table is another great detail, as this was taken right from the novel as well. It also makes perfect sense, because Durmstrang Institute studies a lot more of the dark arts than Hogwarts, so they'd of course get along with the Slytherins more than anybody else at the school. Also, fun fact, Draco was very close to going to Durmstrang, as Lucius and Karkaroff both being former Death Eaters were close, but Narcissa Draco's mother did not want him going that far away, so we went to Hogwarts instead. If you look at all of the desserts, they're actually all fake food, and the props department loved making things that made the cast hungry, knowing they could never eat any of it. It's very fitting and very good writing on the filmmaker's part that Barty Crouch's acknowledgement and walk to the front is interrupted by the fake Moody, aka his son Barty Crouch Jr., who despised his father. The mention of an aura. Aura? Dark wizard catcher. It's the career that both Harry and Ron would end up taking on after the series ended, though Ron only lasted at this job for a little while before working at the joke shop with his brother. Looking at this magical eye, the real Moody lost his real eye during the first Wizarding War, where he also got many scars and even chunks taken out of his face, but he was regarded as the best Auror of all time. Also, Moody drinking from his hip flask was something he always did because he did not trust anyone. He was always so paranoid that someone from his past would try to kill him, which is why it's so brilliant of Barty Jr. to just use that same hip flask and fill it with Polyjuice Potion. The Goblet of Fire in the film has the incredible detail of part of Hogwarts Castle being carved into its base. The Goblet of Fire is also a sentient being, much like the Sorting Hat, only it can't talk. This is why a spell like the Confundus Charm, which is what Barty Jr. used to put Harry's name in, was successful. It confuses the Goblet just like a Confundus Charm would confuse a human. I tried to figure out what these markings said, but doing some research online, it means nothing. It's just a bunch of random symbols based on Elder Futhark. The person sitting next to Cho Chang is Roger Davies, a Ravenclaw student who was actually Cho's Quidditch captain where she played Seeker and he played Chaser. Roger actually asked Cho out in the fifth book, but she said no because she liked Harry. And in the shot, you can also get a better look at Fleur's younger sister Gabrielle. The Goblet's blue flames are just as described in the book, and in this next shot of Hogwarts, you can see how the blue flames illuminate the entire Great Hall at night. In Moody's, or Barty Jr.'s classroom, you see what's called faux glass, a type of dark detector that was first introduced in this book, but this one is much larger than the one in the novel as it takes up the entire room. This is also the same classroom that Lockhart and Lupin had, as evidenced by the staircase that leads to the DA DA teacher's office. The old Codger can see out the back of his head. Moody can in fact see through pretty much anything with his magical eye, including Harry's invisibility cloak, which is wild because that's literally one of the Deathly Hallows, three of the most powerful objects in the world. Because of this, this has made many people speculate that Moody's eye is a fourth Deathly Hallow. These worms right here are most likely flobber worms, worms in the wizarding world that Hagrid actually turned to in his Care of Magical Creatures class after the fiasco with Buckbeak in his first ever lesson. He wanted to play it safe, so he went with the most boring creatures in the wizarding world. Crab has the same Slytherin ring that I pointed out on Draco earlier, something I also mentioned in the last video of the series. How do we sort out the liars? Moody or Barty saying this while Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle were sitting right there is thought provoking because all three of their fathers did exactly that and got away with it. Professor Sprout tells me you have a aptitude for herbology. Neville did in fact excel in herbology, and after the series ended, he worked as the herbology professor at Hogwarts, first being mentored by his favorite teacher, Professor Sprout, and then taking over when she retired. The reason why Neville was so affected by the torture curse is because his parents were tortured into madness by Bellatrix, Rodolphus, and Rebastian Lestrange, and oddly enough, the very man who tortured the spider in front of him, Barty Crouch Jr. And the crazy thing about this is the man that did this to his parents actually cheered him up about what happened to his parents. Mom, we'll have a cup of tea. I want to show you something. That is the direct example that shows how much of a psychopath Barty Jr. is. 
killing curse. Only one person is known to have survived it, and he's sitting in this room. The reason Harry survived the killing curse when it was unblockable is because his mother sacrificed herself trying to save Harry. This triggered the very powerful magic known as love, thus putting a protection on Harry so that when the killing curse hit him, the love shield made it bounce back off of him and hit Voldemort instead, who only survived because of his horcruxes. The scene on the staircase was shot in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and it also made an appearance in the last movie as well. This is weird though, because in this film, this is where you exit the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom, but in the third film, it's where you exit the Divination classroom. The film used this crying stained glass window to perfectly transition from Neville's devastated state, which I always thought was really clever. You can see Neville reading a book here, which we later find out was a herbology book given to him by the fake Moody, and it was called The Magical Water Plants of the Highland Locks. The age line has some really cool details of ancient runes spread across the circle, which I honestly never noticed until looking really deeply at this film for this video. The book that Hermione sits down to read says Tri Wizard, and I can't read the rest, but she's clearly reading a book about the history of the Tri Wizard tournament, which is a great little detail and really adds up to Hermione's character. As soon as they found out that they were having the Tri Wizard tournament, she went to the library and got a book about it. If you're wondering who this guy, who's always with Crumb and Karkaroff, is, it was a character and role made just for the actor named Tolga Safer. He had auditioned for the part of Crumb, but because he looked nothing like the character, he didn't get the part. However, director Mike Newell was so impressed with him that he made up this role as Karkaroff's aide so that he could be in the film. In between scenes, we get a shot of the clock tower, which played a huge part in the last movie. For all of these Goblet of Fire scenes, I noticed they removed all of the floating candles in the Great Hall. I guess they did this because they wanted to make sure that the Goblet of Fire was the main focal point. The Triwizard Cup was designed to have trees and vines growing on it, which is a really cool detail. The trophy itself is very old, as it was made around the year 1294 AD when the first Triwizard Tournament took place. For reference, this was 304 years after the creation of Hogwarts in the year 990 AD. In those 304 years, the tournament itself took place 125 times times, but it was shut down in 1792, which means that this is the first time the tournament has taken place in 202 years. The story behind it shutting down was that a cockatrice, a magical creature that is half rooster, half lizard, got loose during a task and went on a rampage, injuring the three judges, each of whom were the heads of each school, and that is why they now have four judges. This trophy room is where the midnight duel almost took place, and where Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Neville were almost caught in the very first book, a scene that the first film did not incorporate. Looking at all of these trophies, some shoot out smoke, some shoot out sparks, and others spin, adding a magical element to the otherwise unmagical awards. The biggest trophy in the middle of the room has a giant golden snitch on the top, which a seeker from Hogwarts probably won. Perhaps an older student who made it to the pros won this award and then decided to give it to the school. Either that, or it could have been an award for beating another school's Quidditch team, which is actually something I would love to see. Imagine a Hogwarts all-star team with the best players from each house. That would be epic! But anyway, the set for the trophy room following the fourth film was actually turned into the set for the Room of Requirement in the rest of the movies. You can see this very clearly from the glass up here. Hurry, right, you put your name in the cupboard of the fire. He asked calmly. <laughs> you seem to have given this a fair bit of thought. Medi. Karkaroff calling Moody out for giving the plan a fair bit of thought is attention grabbing because he is of course the one that put Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire, adding a fourth school and making Harry the only student at that school, forcing the Goblet to pick him. This is another shot that I absolutely love as all of the adults just look at Harry, each so easy to read. Karkaroff is angry. Maxime is like, good luck, you're gonna die, kid. Barty Sr. is like, damn, this is gonna be hard to explain back at the ministry. Dumbledore is just worried. McGonagall is like, how did we let this happen? Moody or Barty Jr. has a look like, I did what my master asked. And Snape is just looking at Harry as he always does, annoyed with his existence. Dumbledore is of course using the pensive here, which plays a huge part in the rest of the series, from Harry seeing the trial, to seeing Snape's worst memory, all of Voldemort's memories, and of course the prince's tale. Introducing it earlier than the books did, and showing how you take memories out of your head was a brilliant move by the filmmakers. Also, the wand that Dumbledore uses here is of course the Elder Wand, one of the Deathly Hallows, which the filmmakers did not know at the time, because the final book was still two years away from being released when this movie was made. In Ron's corner of their dorm, you can see he brought some Chudley Cannon stuff, like 
like this flag, this poster, and the sticker on the mirror. You can also see his Gryffindor scarf and robes next to him, which he clearly just took off to put on his PJs. Then on Harry's bedside table, you can see a picture of his mother and father, which as I said in my last video, was probably taken from the book that Hagrid gave him at the end of his first year. Along with the picture, Harry also has an acid pop, as well as Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans. I don't want eternal glory, I just want to be... This line is just incredible because it shows how Harry is conflicted with who he is. He was about to say, I just want to be Harry. But as he starts to say it, he realizes he doesn't want that either. He gets so much attention that he never wanted. The cameraman with Rita is a man named Bozo, and after the series ended, Rowling released an article about him on her website saying that he was the same photographer as the one in the Chamber of Secrets with Lockhart. Also, the camera he's using is powered by magic rather than electricity like muggle cameras, and this is what allows the photos to be able to move. This photo shoot once again takes place in the trophy room, and I just have to point out Rita slapping Fleur in the face. It cracks me up every time. In the broom cupboard, you can see a bucket, which is Madame Glossy's Silver Polish, a magical cleaning solution, which is probably what Filch uses to clean the school. It's a broom cupboard. You should feel right at home then. This line, of course, refers to Harry living in the cupboard under the stairs at the Dursleys for so many years. Just ignore the quill. The quick quotes quill is exactly as described in the book. Acid green and writes on its own. These kinds of quills are known for listening and changing what the person being interviewed says, which of course makes Rita love it, as it basically tells lies and false stories just like she does. In this shot of Hogwarts, you can see the clock tower courtyard as well as the bridge that played a big part in the last movie. I said this in my Prisoner of Azkaban easter egg video, but this bridge was made just for the films. It was never mentioned in the novels. As we move over, you can see the Allery, which is placed perfectly as the book says it's in the West Tower. However, though it is on the west side of the castle, it is not connected to the rest of the school the way it was in the books. Also, looking at these mountains back here, that's where Moody arrived, which, if you remember, I said showed the other side of Hogwarts than we normally see. The detail in the Allery is great, as you can see poop is just covered everywhere. In the Gryffindor common room, the tapestry that covers the wall is part of what's known as the Lady with a Unicorn, a medieval tapestry from France which Stort Craig thought would fit well with the red and gold Gryffindor colors. It looks like some students left their robes out as well as some books, which fits well because in the novels, the common room is where Gryffindor students do the bulk of their homework. On this copy of the Daily Prophet, it's just Harry in the picture, which also happened in the novel. It was all about him, Rita Skeeter only mentioning Fleur and Crumb once, and not even mentioning Cedric at all. Also, the films came up with a column for Rita entitled Me, Myself, and I, which we see a few times throughout the movie. Harry Potter, age 12. The voice reading the article seemed to work like a howler, but without screaming. And we know the paper was actually reading it out loud, because it gasped as Harry crumpled it up. How the flu network works is you can send your whole body somewhere, or you can send just your head leaving your body behind, and that's exactly what Sirius did here. In this scene, you can see Neville taking a plant-like thing from the Great Lake, which happens to be Gillyweed, the plant he gives Harry later in the movie, which of course allowed him to breathe underwater during the second task. The dragon enclosure has a big M with another M inside of it, which stands for the Ministry of Magic. However, the dragons did not come from the Ministry of Magic in London. They actually came from the Ministry's post in Romania known as the Romanian Dragon Sanctuary, which is actually where Charlie Weasley, the second oldest Weasley child, works. Charlie was also among the dragon tamers during the scene in the book, but he was not there for the film. These are seriously misunderstood creatures. This line from Hagrid is a nice little detail because it's very similar to a line he said in a deleted scene from the first film. Vastly misunderstood beasts, Harry. Vastly misunderstood. The Potter Stinks badges you see everyone wearing were actually made by Malfoy and the Slytherins. Also, it adds up that two Hufflepuff students, one of which is Hannah Abbott, would really rub it in Harry's face, because Hufflepuffs in the book were furious with Harry for taking away the one moment of glory they had with Cedric being the Hogwarts champion. You can hear Seamus talking to Ron about blowing stuff up. It's not like I tried to blow things up exactly. Which hilariously refers to the running gag in the films of Seamus always causing explosions. Seeing Goyle get bitten by a ferret, aka Malfoy, might be the filmmakers making up for cutting scabbers biting him on the train in the first book. They're pretty similar, as both creatures were really humans in an animal form, Draco being the ferret and Peter Pettigrew being the rat. We see Moody, or Barty Jr., make a mocking face at McGonagall, which interestingly highlights his tongue. This is interesting because his tongue movements throughout the film are pretty significant, and we'll talk more about that later in the video. 
In Moody's office, you can see even more of the faux glass that I mentioned earlier that was in his classroom. When looking into it, you can see Barty Jr.'s enemies, and I always thought that the old guy looked like Sir Ian McKellen, aka Gandalf or Magneto, and that the other one looked like Dracula. You can also see Moody's head reflected behind him, which might not be his, Barty Jr.'s own reflection, but rather the real Moody's, who is an enemy that is very close. And just to further prove this, right after seeing that, the real Moody tries to break out of the trunk. In the office, you can also see a cot in the back, which tells us this is not only his office, but his bedroom as well. Looking at this shot, they put the stadium for the first task way off the Hogwarts grounds, which also means that these are the mountains where Moody came in. As the shot pans around, you can see how far into the highlands of Scotland Hogwarts really is, which is just beautiful. Also, they have a flag for each champion, one for Durmstrang, one for Bobaton, one for Hufflepuff, and one for Gryffindor. The twins gambling on the tournament is a nice easter egg, as it's pretty much what defined their character arcs in this book. It references them betting at the Quidditch World Cup with Ludo Bagman, a character who was cut from the movie. They win the bet, but Bagman never pays them, so they spend the whole book trying to get their money. I have to say, it's great to see the twins have a similar arc to their book arc, even if it's in a very different way. It really shows how creative the screenwriters are. Also, it's a great detail that they have the betting odds for each champion on the inside of the twins case. Looking at these odds, Cedric's odds are plus 175, meaning he's the heavy favorite to win. Then Crumb is plus 500, meaning he's the second most likely to win. Then Fleur is plus 1000, meaning she does not have much of a chance. And Harry is all the way back at plus 3000, meaning he's the heavy favorite to lose and lose by a lot. So basically if you bet on Harry you made a hell of a lot of money because he tied for first place. You can see Fleur and Crumb flags in the stadium and you can also see people wearing Potter Stink slash support Cedric Diggory badges meaning everyone had supporters except Harry. Although we later see some signs for him in the Gryffindor section. One of the most book accurate signs though is one for Cedric that says Cedric Diggory the true Hogwarts champion which was taken right from the page. One thing that I noticed that's really interesting is each champion has a different style of uniform. Cedric and Harry's are relatively the same, only Harry's has Gryffindor while Cedric's has Hufflepuff. Fleur, meanwhile, has an almost sweatsuit with a sort of varsity jacket, and Crumbs is just a sweater with loose open robes over top. We again see Bozo accompanying Rita Skeeter, and he even has a press badge, which is a great detail. The mini horntail that Harry picked out was something he actually kept, and he even had it on his bedside table in the book. In the corner of the tent, you can see first aid kits, which in the book was used quite a lot on the four champions, as they all got hurt in some way or another during this task. In the stands, you can see both Cedric and Fleur, both of whom have injuries from their turn taking on the dragon. Fleur has a cut over her eye, and Cedric is holding his head in pain. You want Harry! The reason why Hermione tells Harry to use his wand is because she helped him practice the summoning charm to call his broomstick to him in the book before the task. Ron, Malfoy, and the twins are all wearing the same hats they wore in the last film during the Hogsmeade sequence. I've always found it interesting to see how they repeat outfits and clothes throughout the series. Looking at their route, Harry and the dragon pass the Owlery, then fly past the clock tower courtyard, and then end up on the tower that holds the headmaster's office, which are these three little extensions that the Horntail is on. Once they start back up again, it's odd that we see people in the courtyard because wouldn't everybody be in the stands watching the tournament? It's the biggest event the school has seen in 200 years, you would think everybody would be there. The wall they crash into is a viaduct I pointed out in previous videos, and it's also the same one we see in the Deathly Hallows Part 2 as well as in the Fantastic Beast films. But for those, the viaduct actually changed locations from where it was in the first six movies. They have amazing detail on the reflection of the egg, as you can see Harry flying towards it, and they even have his glove pattern there when he gets close enough. In this painting cheering for Harry, these wizards are playing wizard's chess. This painting might be a nod to the famous film Psycho, as she screams terribly and even has bloodstains behind her, which would suggest a stabbing just like in the movie. Boys. This line was taken right from the book, only it happened much earlier while still at the burrow before school started. In this exterior shot of Hogwarts, you can see how the owls fly into the Great Hall to drop off mail, which I thought was really cool. On the tables in the Great Hall, you can see Pixie Puffs as well as Cheery Owls, both of which are kinds of cereal in the Wizarding World. On the Daily Prophet that Hermione is reading, it says, Ministry Witch Still Missing. 
This is an amazing reference to Bertha Jorkins, a witch who was kidnapped in the book and was later killed by Voldemort. And she was also the murderer that I mentioned earlier that Voldemort used to make Nagini a horcrux. You can also see it says Spellbound Unbound, which refers to a wizarding band and their downfall, which was a story that developed in the Daily Prophet in the last movie. In the article about Hermione, you can see a picture of Crumb, which we saw Bozo take in the tent earlier, which is just really great attention to detail. Also, we have another article part of Rita Skeeter's column in The Prophet, Me, Myself, and I, that again, only the movies had. Harry spinning his water out was taken straight from the book, but in the book, it happened when he saw Cho at the Quidditch World Cup. Also, Harry wearing a sling is another good reference to the book, as he hurt his shoulder pretty badly during the first task. In the background, you can see breakfast sandwiches moving on their own, which was probably the work of the Hogwarts house elves who worked in the kitchens below, and who magically sent food up to the tables in the Great Hall. You can again see Angelina sitting between the Weasley twins, which again is fitting because she would date one and marry the other. Filch struggling with things is a running gag in this film, as he lets the cannons off too soon. Mr. Diggory, the sound of the cannon you <laughs> And here he struggles with the record player. Has been a tradition of the Triwizard Tournament. You can also see Filch's cat Mrs. Norris right here, and I love her yellow eyes. The House of Godric Gryffindor has- The mention of Godric Gryffindor is of course one of the four founders of Hogwarts, which as I said earlier was established in 990 AD when Godric was alive. Something's about to burst out of Eloise Midgen, but I don't think it's a swamp. <laughs> Alois Midgen is another great easter egg, as she was known for having bad acne in the books, and once she even tried to rid herself of pimples with magic, which unfortunately led to her nose falling off. Madame Pomfrey had to reattach it, but from then on, her nose was permanently off-center. You can see three girls watching Harry pass with great interest, which I had a thought, these could possibly be the three girls that asked him to the Yule Ball in the book. The middle one matches the description of a Hufflepuff girl, and the girl to her left fits the description of a fifth year girl who was a foot taller than him, as this girl is very tall. Didn't know her very well, she left when I was about three. Oh. No, not in the maternal sort of her. Broke me dad's heart though. Hagrid talking about his mother and father is another thing taken straight from this book, as we find out that his mother was a giant test who left him when he was young, and his father was a tiny little human man. This shot is on the edge of the Great Lake, and is where the famous giant squid at Hogwarts lives, and is also the lake where the second task would take place. In the background, you can see fire starting, which might be the work of Seamus Finnegan, who was of course known for blowing stuff up. You can also see Malfoy laughing here after watching Harry and Ron get hit in the back of the head by Snape. Harry walks past the rocks where Hermione punched Draco in the last movie, and as I said in my Prisoner of Azkaban video, these rocks were heavily inspired by Stonehenge. Also, remember how I mentioned the Owlery was separate from the rest of the school? Yeah, well, imagine doing this long walk through the snow and then having to climb all the stairs of this massive tower that, adding to this, we find out is also icy. Watch yourself in stairs, it's a bit icy at the top. And speaking of this tower, there's the great detail of Cho Chang up there already sending her out on its way. As they enter the common room, it's clearly Christmas time, as coats and scarves are hung up, and there's also a present right here. You can also see the Gryffindor notice board, which is very prominent in the books, giving students information on upcoming events. And here you can see a poster for the Yule Ball that's coming up. The reason why Ron asked Fleur out the way he did... I just all slipped out. Actually, he sort of screamed her. Uh, it was a bit frightening. It's because of the quarter Vila in her, which granted doesn't make her irresistible to men the way a full Vila would, but it does make men say and do stupid things in front of her. Also, it's funny that that was their first ever interaction, seeing as Fleur would soon become his sister-in-law. I've said this in past videos, but the Patil twins both being in Gryffindor is different from the books because Padma is actually in Ravenclaw, not Gryffindor. I don't know, my great aunt Tessie. Ron's mention of his great aunt Tessie was not an aunt from the books, that was a character made just for the movies. The only Weasley aunt that we know about is Aunt Muriel, who we saw at Bill and Fleur's wedding. And speaking of Fleur, Fleur's date is Roger Davies, the Ravenclaw boy who was sitting next to Cho earlier in the film. During one take of Hermione walking down the stairs, Emma Watson actually stepped on a dress and fell down. I got down about three steps and fell down <laughs> in front of the whole set, which was incredibly embarrassing. We're just gonna take a second to admire the work Stuart Craig did for the Yule Ball set. This this was the Great Hall, meaning they covered every wall to make it white, made the hogs silver instead of bronze, got these huge Christmas trees, and just had such good attention to detail. Even these ice sculptures had so much thought put into them, as they were modeled after the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, England. We see Flitwick conducting the orchestra, which he did in the last film as well, and this becomes a running theme throughout the movies, despite the fact that there was never any mention of this in the books. 
A funny detail during the Yule Ball is that the fake Moody has a dead ferret as part of his outfit, which says a lot about what he might have done to Malfoy had McGonagall not stepped in. You can see Malfoy dancing with a girl who was supposed to be Pansy Parkinson, who Draco sort of dated during his time at Hogwarts. The band playing at the Yule Ball is the Weird Sisters, a famous band in the Wizarding World, and we find out in the book that Dumbledore himself booked them for the kids. They sing the song Do the Hippogriff, which was a title taken from the book but was actually produced for the movie, and later they sing This is the Night, which was not mentioned in the book and was made solely for the film. This film could not say the name of the band due to a legal dispute with a Canadian folk band called the Weird Sisters, weird being spelled slightly differently. Which is sort of petty if you ask me. They really said no you can't use this name even though we spell it differently. Warner Brothers was so fed up that they were just like whatever, we won't even say the name. I don't think it was the books that had him going to the library. This line from Harry refers to Crumb constantly being in the library simply to see Hermione, which actually annoyed Hermione at first, as it would attract distracting, giggling girls. The person who asked Pravati to dance was Karkaroff's aide, who I mentioned earlier. He's way too old. What? What? That's what you think? Yeah, that's what I think. You know, Ron sort of has a point here, because Hermione was 14 years old at the time of the Yule Ball, the age of a freshman in high school. And Crumb was 18 years old, which is when kids go off to college. So imagine a freshman in college dating a freshman in high school. That's sort of sketchy if you ask me, so... Behind them, you can see a girl crying and being consoled by her friends, meaning she probably didn't have the best night. And these stairs just kind of turn into a place where girls cry when Hermione plops down. In the last shot of the ball, you can see Fred and Angelina dancing, and this was the beginning of them dating. You can also see that Fleur and Roger Davies had a nice night, as they're still dancing. You can see Neville and Ginny dancing, and look at Seamus getting up close and personal with a Bobaton girl. Good for him. In Harry's dream, we get our first look at the Dark Mark tattoo, which, fun fact, was actually red in the book and only turned black when Voldemort called his followers to him. I imagine the red didn't photograph well, hence why they made it permanently black. For a split second, when Harry wakes up from his dream, you can see the green killing curse in his eye, which he had just been hit with in his dream. Also, this might be a nod to the fact that Book Harry had green eyes. The film, of course, tried to give him green eyes in the film, but Daniel Radcliffe had a bad reaction to the contact lenses on the first day of shooting, so they just went with Daniel's blue eyes. The bridge where Harry and Hermione talk is the same place where Harry and Lupin had their conversation in the last film. Mostly, he watches me study. It's a bit annoying, actually. This is another line that refers to Crumb hanging out in the library just to watch Hermione. Looking at the incredible prefix bathroom, Harry was not strictly speaking allowed to use it, but he actually was in his sixth year when he became Quidditch captain. The mermaid was another thing taken straight from the page, only in the book she was on a painting, not on a window. I could swear I saw a bit of Polyjuice Potion. Not being a bad boy again, are you, Harry? Polyjuice Potion? Myrtle mentioning Polyjuice Potion was a brilliant addition because in this chapter in this book, there's a whole sequence with Snape, Filch, and the fake Mad-Eye where we find out someone was stealing Polyjuice Potion ingredients from Snape's office. This was a great way for the filmmakers to give us that information in a quick way without taking up too much time. The singing voice coming out of the egg was sung by the Mer people, who of course reside in the Great Lake on the Hogwarts grounds. This scene takes place in the Hogwarts library, which we've seen in both the first and second film. I love the effect of the books flying around on their own, clearly influenced by magic, most likely by Madame Pince, the Hogwarts librarian. You'd be better off with Garshock's Guide to Herbology. The mention of this book, which was clearly written by someone with the last name Gawshawk, immediately makes you think of Miranda Gawshawk, the author of the Standard Book of Spells collection, and which I've mentioned in previous videos in the series. But the book Neville was referring to wasn't actually written by Miranda Gawshawk, but one of her sisters, many of whom became authors as well. If you look at the twins' betting odds this time around, they've changed them a bit. Cedric stayed the same at plus 175, Fleur stayed the same at plus 1000, but Crumb went from plus 500 to plus 200, and Harry went way up, going from plus 3000, the worst odds to win, to plus 100, the best odds to win. This black Gryffindor student that daps up one of the twins could possibly be their best friend Lee Jordan. This character is played by Jamal Hugh Bonner and is simply credited as Gryffindor student. Knowing that he's a Gryffindor student is important because in the books, there are only two black Gryffindor boys. We have Dean Thomas and Lee Jordan. And in the film, we have a third black Gryffindor boy being Bem, the character that the films made up in the last movie. It's definitely not Bem though because we obviously have his credit in the other movie. And we already know what Dean Thomas looks like in this movie. So it's very likely that this is meant to be a recast Lee Jordan. 
The plant gillyweed has an interesting past because I think the filmmaker sort of messed up here. They tried to make their own lore on chocolate frog cards, saying that Beaumont Madgerie Banks was the first person to discover the plant, and Eladora Ketteridge was the first person to discover the plant's magical properties. However, Kettleridge died 13 years before Beaumont was born, so Beaumont wouldn't have even had a chance to discover the plant so that Ketteridge could find out its magical properties. I'm guessing they accidentally switched the years around, so Eladora should have been younger, not older but I just noticed that and thought it was funny. In this wide shot of the stands for the second task, they added the detail of all of the boats we saw them boarding in the last scene, showing us how they got so far out in the lake. Right here, you can see a telescope-like object facing down into the lake. And me guessing, I think this is a telescope that can magically see down below the water to keep track of the champions. The champions' uniforms are cool to look at again, as Cedric and Harry again have the same thing, but one for Gryffindor and one for Hufflepuff. Then, Crumb is wearing a shirt that shows off his muscles a bit more than the Hogwarts champions, and Fleurs is this very sleek bathing suit, and it's the same color as her school uniform. To film this sequence of the second task, Daniel Radcliffe spent 41 hours and 38 minutes underwater, which is absolutely crazy. They also broke new grounds, being one of the first successful teams to use blue screen or green screen underwater. The bubble around both Fleur and Cedric's mouth is a bubblehead charm, which is what they use to breathe underwater. Meanwhile, Crumb tried to transfigure himself into a shark, but he messed up, making only half of his body be a shark while the rest of him was still human. Fig Moody's stopwatch has every number besides the multiples of three written in ancient runes, which is of course a subject at Hogwarts. These merpeople in the lake are a type of merpeople known as selkies, which are normally found in Scotland and are much less beautiful than their warmer water counterparts. The creatures that attack Harry here are Grindelows, which the merpeople often have as pets in their homes underwater. A Grindelow was also the creature that was in Lupin's office the first time Harry entered it. What creature? Sat in the corner the first time Harry Potter visited my office in Hogwarts. What you What creature? A Grindelow! You can see that Angelina is next to Fred, who, as I said before, are now dating. We once again have Bozo in the background taking photos, as well as Rita Skeeter, who, for this scene in the book, was there, but was actually in her Animagus form, as she could turn into a beetle. Like the Marauders, aka James, Sirius, and Pettigrew, she did this illegally without informing the Ministry. Another really cool detail is that the Gillyweed left scars on Harry where his lungs had been, and they keep this going for many scenes after this as well. To lose one's family. Never whole again, are we? This line from Barty Crouch hints at the Crouch family backstory. After Crouch sent his son to Azkaban, his wife became sick and was dying. Her final wish was to switch places with her son in Azkaban, and Crouch obliged, giving her just enough polyjuice potion to look like her son until she died in prison, and he took Barty Jr. home with him. Not trying to lure Potter into one of the Ministry's summer internships, are we? Last boy who went into the Department of Mysteries never came out! The fake Moody's mention of the Department of Mysteries is of course where the battle in the next book slash film would take place, being dubbed the Battle of the Department of Mysteries. This department houses all sorts of different divisions, like the Hall of Prophecies, a time room where they study time travel, a love room where they study the very thing that saved Harry, which I of course mentioned earlier, the arch with the veil, and much more. It's odd that they mention a student intern working in the Department of Mysteries. Not trying to lure Potter into one of the Ministry's summer internships, are we? Last boy who went into the Department of Mysteries never came out! Because the people that work there are known as unspeakables, and they're forbidden from talking about anything they do, keeping a ton of secrets from the rest of the magical world. So they probably wouldn't allow a student intern to work there. And on top of that, I don't think that they even have Hogwarts internships. It's a cool idea, but I don't really know how that would work. Bordy Jr. flicking his tongue here foreshadows his true identity, as both we and his father see him do this while in his own body in a flashback, explaining why his father is so shaken by this. Also, this was actually something made just for the films. There was no mention of this tongue thing in the novels. The song you hear them singing here is the Hogwarts theme song that they sing at the start of term, and it was actually supposed to be featured in both the first film and this one, but both were cut. We did see it in a deleted scene for the Goblet of Fire, though. Hogwarts, 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 teach us they never actually say this in the movie, but Crouch was killed by his son Barty Jr. while he was in the form of Mad-Eye. You can see the eagle that leads to the headmaster's office, which we saw for the first time in the second film. Also, you can see Fox perched on a stand, and his tail feathers actually play a big part in future events for this movie, which I will go over in a bit. A man has died here, Fudge, and he won't be the last. You must take action. I will not. 
This argument between Dumbledore and Fudge is a reference to the chapter entitled The Parting of the Ways in this book, which saw the two of them fighting and eventually going their separate ways, though much later than the film had it. Licorice snaps are a kind of candy that bites anyone who picks them up, which makes you wonder why they even exist or who would eat them. The courtroom in which this memory takes place is courtroom 10 and is where the most important cases are held. It's also where Harry had his trial in the Order of the Phoenix and is where the trio stole the locket from Umbridge and the Deathly Hallows. If you look at Moody here, he does not have his walking stick, meaning he has not yet lost his leg. You can see that there's a press box where Rita Skeeter of course resides. Rosia. Evan Rosia. Evan Rosier was a Death Eater who was actually friends with Snape Ball at Hogwarts. Their whole friend group was aspiring to become Death Eaters when they finished at school, and Rosier did just that, but was eventually caught and killed by Moody. But before he went down, he took a chunk out of Moody's nose, which this film mentions in a great Easter egg. Dad, yeah, he took a piece of me with him, though, didn't he? <laughs> the mention of Rookwood. There was Rookwood! He was a spy! is Augustus Rookwood, who was actually an unspeakable who worked in the Department of Mysteries, a job I just explained, and he was a spy passing information to Voldemort. He was of course captured after Karkaroff ratted him out, but he escaped Azkaban at the same time as Bellatrix in the next book, and he was one of the Death Eaters who participated in the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, which is fitting because that's where he used to work. But the thing that Rookwood is probably most known for is killing Fred Weasley during the Battle of Hogwarts when he blew up a wall. Severus Snape was indeed a Death Eater. And prior to Lord Voldemort's downfall, turned spy for us. Dumbledore standing up for Snape, of course, references how we changed sides after telling Voldemort the prophecy. He went to Dumbledore after that to help save James and Lily. Wormtail, of course, spoiled that though. Torture of the Auror Frank Longbottom and his wife! Nay. This references something I talked about earlier, that being how Barty Jr. helped torture Neville's parents into madness alongside the Lestranges. Here is where we see Barty Jr.'s tongue flick that ties all of the foreshadowing together. The line that Crouch says to his son, You are no son of mine, was taken right from the page, which I love to see. Right here, you can see a hidden Deathly Hallows sign, which is wild because we didn't learn about the Deathly Hallows until two years later when the final book came out. This means that Rowling herself might have had something to do with this little Easter egg. In this shot of Barty Jr., you can see a tattoo mark on his neck, and this is his prisoner number from when he was in Azkaban, and it's a detail that the films carry out for the rest of the series if a character goes to Azkaban, all starting with Sirius Black's tattoo in the last film. This hallway is where Snape caught Harry out of bed in the last movie, and is where Pettigrew scurried by him in his rat form. It's a sign, Severus. You know what it means as well as I. Karkaroff saying it's a sign refers to his dark mark getting darker, meaning Voldemort is getting stronger. This, of course, terrified Karkaroff because he ratted out so many Death Eaters to the Ministry. Veritas serum. Three drops of this, and you know who himself would spill his darkest secrets. Veritas serum is the truth-telling serum, and is actually what made Barty Jr. admit to everything at the end of this book, and is also what Umbridge tried to use on students in the next book slash movie. Have you brought the Veritas serum? I'm afraid you've used up all my stores interrogating students. You can again see Flitwick conducting the band, which, as I said, is the running theme in the movies. You can also see the Ministry of Magic logo with the M inside of the M again, as well as each school's crest, Durmstrang, Bobaton, and Hogwarts. When Fleur comes out, you can see Roger Davies, Fleur's date to the ball, dancing and cheering for her with the rest of the girls from her school. It's also a great detail to have Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle cheering Crumb on, as their fathers were friends with Crumb's headmaster. Not for long though, because not long after this, all of the Death Eaters went on a hunt for Karkaroff for betraying them, and they eventually killed him. You can again see a flag for each champion just like the Dragon Arena had, Durmstrang, Bobaton, Gryffindor, and Hufflepuff. In the crowd cheering for Harry, we get another look at who I think is Lee Jordan holding up a flag. The champion's uniforms are once again interesting to look at, as Harry and Cedric have the same thing, but one is for Gryffindor and one is for Hufflepuff. Then Fleur has a sort of early 2000s style sweatsuit, which fits with when this movie came out. And Crumb is actually wearing the same thing he wore in the first task, only without the robe on top. In the book, each champion's families came, and we sort of see this in the movie as well. As you can see, the Weasleys came for Harry, you can see Fleur's little sister Gabrielle, although she was there all year, but I'll still count it. And you can see Cedric's father Amos getting him excited, which is actually really sweet, and honestly makes the scene later even more tragic. Here we notice how Dumbledore starts to get suspicious of Moody, as he sort of side-eyes him while he's cheating. We again see the running theme of Filch messing up as he shoots the cannon too early. On the count of three, one... Which is just great comedy. Filch is honestly hilarious in the smallest ways in these movies. The way all sound disappears as Harry enters the maze is exactly how the book described it. 
Crumb's glazed over eyes shows us that he's under the Imperious Curse, one of the three unforgivable curses that allows the user to control whoever they put it on. In this instance, it was Barty Jr. who put it on Crumb, instructing Crumb to take Cedric and Fleur out. Periculum! The spell Periculum comes from the Latin word meaning danger, hence why it's a flare that you normally send up when you're in danger. Spellium! Here, Cedric used the disarming charm on Crumb, which for some reason didn't disarm him, but simply knocked him backwards. The spell that Harry used here was a spell that blasted solid objects to pieces. I always thought it was interesting how Cedric holds his wand with two hands, almost like how a cop would hold his gun, because we never see anyone else do this in the series. We of course see the green light on Cedric, which is the color that goes along with the killing curse. Wormtail locks Harry up in the statue of the Angel of Death, which we saw at the beginning of the film. The potion that Wormtail puts together to bring Voldemort back is called Regeneration Potion, and the reason he needed Harry's blood was so that Lily's love protection that made Voldemort not be able to touch Harry in the first film now be in his veins too, thereby canceling it out. And this is actually very important because this act ensured that Harry didn't die in the forest. I made a whole video about it if you're interested, it's linked below so you can watch it after you finish this video. Voldemort using his wand on the Dark Mark is how he called all of his followers to him. When he does it to one, the others feel theirs burn and know where to apparate to find him. The Death Eaters Voldemort takes down are Crab Sr., Crab. Goyle Sr., Goyle. and McNair, McNair, who is Walden McNair, Buckbeak's almost executor in the last book and film. The hand that Voldemort gives to Wormtail is actually the thing that would kill him three years later, because when he betrayed Voldemort by letting Harry live, the hand turned on him and he choked himself to death. When Voldemort makes Harry bow, he's using the Imperious Curse, the same thing Barty Jr. used on Crumb in the Maze. Then here, Voldemort uses the Torture Curse on Harry, which is another one of the three unforgivable curses, and is the spell that drove Neville's parents into madness. The woman Death Eater behind Voldemort here is most likely Electo Caro, as she was the only female Death Eater in the graveyard for the scene in the book. The others besides Lucius, Crab Sr., Goyle Sr., and McNair are not Selwyn, Corbin Yaxley, Avery, and Electo Caro's brother, Amicus Caro. What happens here during the duel is called Priori Incantatum, which is caused because both Harry and Voldemort's wands share the same core, which, as I teased earlier, is a feather from Fox the Phoenix. This makes this dome go over them, as well as making Voldemort's wand spit out the last few spells it did, all of which were the killing curse, thus bringing out his past victims, including Harry's parents. There's an easter egg later on where Dumbledore mentioned Priori Incantatum, Priori Incantatum. But he never explained what it actually was, so there you go, I just explained it. Seeing Cho crying is noteworthy, as she and Cedric were of course going out before he died, and this left a ton of trauma on Cho, which of course carries into the next book and film. In this shot, you can see just how big the maze is, which is much larger than it was in the book. There, it only took up the Quidditch pitch. The potion Snape pours into the fake Moody's mouth is Veritaserum, which I mentioned earlier. Send an owl to Azkaban. I think they'll find I'm missing a prisoner. Dumbledore mentioning sending Barty Jr. back to Azkaban actually changes Crouch's real fate, which was getting the Dementor's kiss. While we may come from different places and speak in different tongues, our hearts beat as one. Dumbledore saying this line and the filmmaker showing Maxime and Hagrid is a really nice detail, as it hints to us that they're half giants, which this film never actually came out and said. Also, I noticed that they once again got rid of the floating candles in the Great Hall for this scene. And adding to that, as it pans up, there's no magical ceiling. But you can see where the owls flew in earlier in the movie in the exterior shot. In Harry's case, you can see his Gryffindor Quidditch uniform, which he never got to use this year as the Triwizard Tournament replaced Quidditch. In the courtyard, you can see the two Durmstrang students had a relationship with two Bobaton girls, and you can also see a Hogwarts couple next to them. You'll also notice Draco and Crab saying goodbye to Durmstrang friends that they made, and Fleur saying goodbye to her Yule Ball date Roger Davies before going over to Ron. I also love the face that Angelina makes when she sees Hermione being pulled aside by Crumb. Right here, you can see a girl giving what looks like candy from Honeydukes to a Durmstrang boy as a farewell present, and possibly her jealous boyfriend behind her. Just look at the way he lifts his head. As the Durmstrang ship leaves, if you zoom in, you can see that they shoot out a cannonball. Everything's going to change now, isn't it? This line from Hermione references the name of the final chapter in this book, The Beginning. Hermione's line essentially meaning the beginning of everything changing now that Voldemort's back. The beginning of the credits are all on little pieces of paper that are meant to look like they came out of the Goblet of Fire, which I love. There's also a really funny credit at the end that says, No dragons were harmed in the making of this movie. And there it is, a full breakdown of the Goblet of Fire and every single little detail and easter egg pointed out. 
Look out for the next part in this series where I do the same thing for the Order of the Phoenix. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life like my cute dog Loki and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe and look out for more great movie flame videos on the way.